verse 11 onwards, verse 11, and then the citizen's submission. The citizen's submission, verse 12 to 20. The citizen's submission. Look at verse 12, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12. Live such good lives among pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Christians, followers of Jesus, are supposed to be known for good deeds among pagans, among, belief, among unbelievers. They must see our good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Verse 13, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Okay, what is the role as, what is your role and my role as a citizen? Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether the emperor or the, as a supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. So who the governor was sent by him, verse 14 is clear, or to the governors who were sent by him, president of the United States, sent by him, prime minister of India, sent by him, chief minister of Telangana, the state, Indian state I live in, uh, sent by him. You put the name of that political leader who was elected to power, who has, who's ruling over you, sent by God. Scripture is clear. New Testament is clear. First Peter 2.14 is very clear. Or the governors were sent by him. So submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human authority. So we must submit. We must submit. Now, it's a long passage. Uh, I wish I can read every phrase, but the, I'm just going to quickly take you through the acronym G-O-V-T to understand the ethic of how, as Christians, we must relate to the government. G-O-V-T. Okay, it's, it's a short form for government. First, I already talked about this. God-ordained government. God established the government after the flood. Genesis 9-6. Okay, God, it is God who sets up all the human kingdoms. And not only Genesis 9, 6, look at Daniel 4, 32. Okay, let's look at Daniel chapter 4 and verse 32. Very important scripture. In fact, I remember memorizing the scripture when I was a, was a, was a kid. Okay, Daniel 4, 32, you'll be driven away from people and live like with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by you until you acknowledge the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on the on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes the most high is sovereign over kingdoms of the earth and gives them to anyone he wishes the scripture is clear that's the same story in in Romans 13 1 and 2 as well what the Old Testament teaches, the New Testament also says, Romans 13, 1 and 2. Romans 13, 1 and 2. Let everyone be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. Authorities that exist have been established by God. So your government, my, the, gov the government of the country that you live in, the government of the country I live in, established by God. It's a God-ordained government. The same thing is not just mentioned in the chapter 2 of 1 Peter. It's mentioned in chapter 3 as well. 1 Peter chapter 3, 5 and 6. 1 Peter chapter 3, 5 and 6. For this is the verse. 1 Peter chapter 3, 5 and 6. For this is the way holy women of the past who put their hope. Uh, okay, I think I got that wrong. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 13 is very clear. Okay, submit yourself to the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor or as the supreme authority. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 says the same thing. Titus chapter 3 and verse 1 as well. Okay, so 
God ordained government. Okay, next, obey the commands of the government, commands where you don't have to violate scripture while obeying them. Obey, G O, obey. It's there in Acts chapter 4, 18 and 19. Acts chapter 4, 18 and 19 makes this point very clear. Okay, let, shall we read Acts 4, 18 and 19? Where we read about the apostles. They called them again, called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him. You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They are basically told not to preach the gospel, but the authorities owe them. But Peter says they are bound by a higher authority. So they will preach the gospel. So we must obey the government as long as the government does not contradict God's written word. Uh, it's there in the book of Revelation as well. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 14. The Antichrist government will, act, will, will, will give a command. Revelation 13 and verse 14. Okay, it says uh, uh, you, that they, it ordered them. Uh, Revelation 13 and verse 14. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword. But the remnant of God during that time refused to obey that. And they became martyrs. They became martyrs. They are throughout scripture. Exodus chapter 1. Hebrew midwives. Okay. They disobeyed the government of that time. To, and they helped birth babies. Exodus chapter 1, 15 through 21. Uh, Pharaoh told Moses that they had to be slaves of Egypt forever. But Moses, because he heard from God, disobeyed and took his people and marched them out of Egyptian bondage. Exodus chapter 5, 1 through 1 and 2, and then the rest of the book. Uh, 1 Kings 18, 1 Kings 18, Obadiah disobeyed, Prophet Obadiah disobeyed the commands that Jezebel gave. Okay, 1 Kings 18 talks about the command that Jezebel gave. Uh, she brought in a pagan religion, but Obadiah, and she gave a command to kill the prophets of the living God, but Obadiah hid a few of them. He hit a few of them in diso dis disobeying the queen of the land. Her command was clear to kill the prophets of the living God. So G.O. obey the government where it doesn't contradict the written word of God. Paying taxes, obeying traffic rules, you know, uh, having the having pollution check for your vehicle having an insurance for your vehicle, you know, so on and so forth. Obey the government, paying taxes. I, I'm grateful to God uh, that I pay my taxes. No, paying taxes, obeying, we must obey the government. At, when the government does not ask us to contradict the written word of God, if the government asks us to contradict the written word of God, then we need not obey the government. God ordained government, obeying the obeying the Bible not violating commands of the government, and then GOVT, violence not permitted. So even when we choose at times to disobey the government, maybe in the, in the issue of sharing the gospel, or it could be anything else, violence is not permitted. The great example is Daniel. He was ordered by the the, the ruler of the land not to pray to him. But Daniel did not pray to the king. He prayed to the living God. And But Daniel happily accepted the punishment, which was to be thrown in the lion's den. Daniel did not fish, up a, fish out a sword and kill the king and run away. Daniel, the king told him to pray to him or pray to that idol. 
Daniel disobeyed because that is contradicting the written word of God. Daniel continued his prayer. But Daniel happily, without violently reacting, happily accepted punishment. So should it be a time in our nation, wherever we live, okay, wherever it can happen in any country, where the government of our time would say, you can't pray to your God, you can't serve your God, you can't, then we will disobey, but we will not violently attack the rulers. Whatever punishment for that disobedience, whether it's being, whether we should be thrown in jail, in Daniel's case, thrown in a lion's den, we'll happily take that punishment. Okay, don't take the law in your own hands. The Bible is very clear. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. Let's look at Romans 13 and verse 1. It says, let everyone be subject to governing authorities. For there's no authority except that which is God has established. Romans 13 and verse 1. Romans 13 and verse 4. For the one in authority is God's servant. For your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. So the Bible says rulers have authority to bear the sword, which means, uh, again, this is going to another subject. Uh, it is there and uh, it is a, actually a full category in biblical ethics. Okay, rulers, the Bible says in Ro Romans 13 and verse 4, rulers have the authority to bear the sword, which means they can wage war and people can die in that war. So they have the power to wage war. God, God gives them that power. Of course, some of the wars may be unfairly waged, but we, we will hope and pray that they use, uh, they will wage war for a just cause. They can wage war and they can also punish criminals, the serial rapists and the child molesters and uh, so on and so forth. Some of them, or the, the, those who engage in terror attacks, God gives governments power to bear the sword. But that also means you and I can't bear the sword. We, you and I were not part of the government. We cannot bear the sword. Suppose the government asks us to do something which is not, which is not in line with God's word. We must not do it. But whatever punishment the government gives us, as Daniel did, we happily take it. Not easy. We don't rebel. We don't take the sword. The permission to take the sword still rests with the government. God gives it. Romans 13, 4. For the one in authority is God's servant. Okay? For your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants. Agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrong doer. Wrong doer. So God has shared his punishment, but his power, his power, power that he will wield in full force on the final day of judgment. God has shared some of that power here and now with the governments of our land and they, after consultation and after going through several levels, which goes all the way up to Supreme Court, they have the power to execute people here and now. You know, death, electric chair, death, and death by hanging and different government have, governments have different systems. They have the power to do that. But we don't have the power. We, the people, don't have the power. But God has shared, given that power to the governments of our land. Okay. So violence not permitted in civil disobedience. First, okay, G-O-V-T, God ordained government, obey the Bible, not violating commands of the government. B-G-O-V, violence not permitted in civil disobedience. And then last thing, when it comes to the relationship with the government, take it to the Lord. G-O-V-T, take it to the Lord. This is the main responsibility that we have with regard to the government, take it to the Lord. First Timothy chapter two, verse one onwards. First Timothy chapter two, verse one onwards. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made to made for all people, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. The Bible is very clear. G O V T. How do you relate with the government? The T reminds us that we must take it to the Lord. Take your president to the Lord. Take your prime minister to the Lord. Take your chief minister to the Lord. Take your governor to the Lord. Take your member of parliament to the Lord. Mention his name in the Lord's presence. 
pray for him. Pray for him. Very, very important. That's very, very important. Uh, so, in, in short, this is how Christians uh, actually uh, connect with the Christians and government. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay, the citizen submission. And then finally, I'm going to close now. Okay, the ultimate passion. First Peter chapter 2, chosen chapter 2. Covering contemporary issue, we'll just men we'll mention the last thing, the ultimate passion, verse 21 onwards to the end. Okay. Uh, in fact, here in this passage, uh, if you give, get the context of First Peter, when First Peter was written, persecution against Christians was slowly beginning. And Peter was preparing the believers to face that persecution, accept it as their lot and endure. And in fact, that's that's a call that the, the Bible gives uh, repeatedly, that we that, that Christians endure, patient endurance is there in the book of Revelation as well. Patient endurance, okay? And uh, patient endurance is there in 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13, Revelation 13, 10 as well. 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. So here as well. So the example for patient endurance in... First Peter chapter 2 is the way Jesus went and faced his death. And that's the last focus, the ultimate passion. We are talking about the passion of Christ. Uh, it says, verse 20, let's, let's read uh, verse 20 onwards. First Peter chapter 2, verse 20. But how is it to your credit that if you receive a beating for doing wrong and, and, and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good you, and you endure it, this is commendable to God. To this you were called, okay, verse 21, 1 Peter 2, 21, Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you must follow in his footsteps. He committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. So Peter is making a point we can't miss. See, should the government unfairly punish us, we have the example of Jesus who was unfairly punished. So following his example, why did Jesus die? There are many answers. Jesus died to take us take away our sin, and Jesus died as a as as a offering of sac satisfaction to Father God, so on and so forth. That's a bit separate study. But Jesus died, you know, to open the door of uh, opportunity of salvation for us when we repent from sin and come to Him. His blood cleanses us, and we can be saved. But Jesus died also as an example, and this passage talks about it. When, when we are unfairly punished, just as Jesus, you know, verse 23, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. Some of you may be in a marriage relationship where insults are hurled at you. I want you to take inspiration from Jesus. You may be in a country where the government is actually hurling insults at you or putting you on the back foot. Peter says in God's word, we must take inspiration from Jesus. When they hurled insult, insults at him, he did not retaliate when he suffered. He made no threats. Oh, wow. <laughs> he made no threats. And you know what? When you threaten somebody, you steal a prerogative that only belongs to God. When you threaten somebody, if you do this, I will do this. When you threaten somebody, you take up, you steal a prerogative that belongs exclusive to God. Because you and I do not know what is going to happen in the next 10 seconds or next one second or next nanosecond. Because we don't even know whether we'll be alive. There's only one person who has the future in his control, and that is God. God can make threats. Okay, God, in fact, is not when he talks about hell. When Jesus, uh, when when Jesus is the greatest hell preacher who ever lived, who talked about hell eight times. He talked talked so many times about hell. He was not only making a threat; he will carry out the threat because hell is real and actual, and hell is true. Okay, so threats are in God's jurisdiction, but we threaten people all the time. That's not something we should be doing. But here, Jesus, even though he could have threatened people, the Bible says he made no threats. 
He did not retaliate when he suffered. Instead, he entrusted himself to God who judges justly. That is the reason why when we are unfairly treated by family or government, we leave it to God because he is a perfect judge. He entrusts himself. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. That is his father. He himself, verse 24, powerful verse. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. What a grand statement of the gospel. Jesus bore our sins in his body. Our body is a sinful body. Maybe sinful because of masturbation, sinful because of sexual immorality, sinful because of it has been allowed because of sexual touching by a person, not our spouse. Our body needs to be punished and be back to hell. But Jesus loves us. He offered his body, sinless body, holy body, pure body. His, the punishment should come to my body. The punishment should come to your body. The punishment should come to our body, our sinful bodies. But sinless Jesus offered his body as a, as a substitute. You know, Jesus is God in flesh, 100% human, 100% God. So because he's 100% God, as he's 100% human, he's infinite. So he can die for an infinite number of us, past tense, present tense, future tense. He can die for all of humanity, infinite number of humans, past, present, and future, because he's 100% God, 100% human, 100% God dying on our behalf. He offered his body as a punishment for infinite number of bodies full of sin. Those bodies need to be punished. He took our place. He became our substitute. He himself bore our sins in his body, verse 24, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. That's the purpose of the cross. We are in the Lent season, that we might live to righteousness. We might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you've been healed. So people who say that the context of healing of that this popularly used verse, the context, and you just saw that, is healing from sin, healing from sin. That is the immediate context. Can God heal your body? Absolutely. And I, I never get tired of talking about how God gave back heartbeat to my little daughter who was declared dead by a medical scan when she was still in her mother's womb. When my little daughter was still in her mother's womb, a medical scan said she had no heartbeat. We prayed, God did a miracle. God has done miracles for me. Uh, I, I ha had several wheezing attacks. I'd go tell my mom, mom, I want to die. I don't want to live. But I prayed. Friends prayed, family prayed. And I've never had a wheezing attack. The last wheezing attack came in the 90s when I was still in my secular college. So God can heal here and now? Yes, if it is his will. But the context of this verse, by his wounds you have been healed. As you see clearly in this verse, 1 Peter 2.24, is, uh, is healing from sin. Or helping us overcome sin. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are like sheep going astray. But now you're written to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. Uh, you know, I want to finish with this. The last verse says, introduces, gives a new name for Jesus. The shepherd. You now, some young people, especially the Google Geners, are disappointed by what some shepherds have done. Unprintable things they supposedly did. Disappointed by scandals in Christian leadership. Don't get disappointed. Don't, 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 don't get, don't lose your faith because of that. Because they are just a shepherd. But the shepherd, Jesus, the shepherd and the overseer of your souls, he is still without sin. He still remains your example. And our eyes should be focused on him. While we, while there is no excuse for such behavior, and such behavior should be you know, biblically, you know, condemned in the, with, with, with a view that it be a warning for the generation that follows. The scripture talks about it. 
In fact, in 1 Peter, 1 Corinthians 5, a man was sleeping with his own stepmother. Apostle Paul told the church to keep him out of the church. You know, not allow that person to come to the fellowship so that in a shame, he will at least get a chance to repent and be saved. First Corinthians 5, First Corinthians 5, read that chapter. Okay, Paul never excused sexual sin in the church. Uh, whoever, whoever did it, he said, if that person is stubborn, it, he has to be placed, placed outside. And in that shame, Paul hoped some repentance will come so that at least on the final day, he'll be saved because without repentance, nobody's going to get saved. Without repentant faith in Jesus, nobody will get saved. So that's that's the story of 1 Corinthians 5. But while we all these things, scandals come before us, sometimes we tend to look at a shepherd, what a shepherd did, and we sort of lose our enthusiasm for the things of God. We don't have to lose our enthusiasm because the Bible presents Jesus as the shepherd. A shepherd may have failed, but the shepherd and the overseer of your souls, he still remains our example and we still keep going. Okay, on that note, we finish our study. And the last section was the ultimate passion, the cross of Christ, which, en en which encourages us to endure whether the government treats us unfairly or X, Y, Z treats us unfairly. We have an inspiration from that supreme act of passion and sacrifice to keep going. Shall we close our eyes and ask God to bless this time? Uh, Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for helping us look at First Peter chapter 2 closely. Lord, I pray for everyone who has heard the study uh, through Zoom and some following on, Inst on Facebook, some following on Instagram, some will later follow it on YouTube. Lord, I just pray that everyone every believer will realize through the study that they are priests unto God, that they will not be seat warmers in the local church, but soul winners in God's kingdom, that they will go after the loss. They will proclaim your, the good news. They'll talk about the light of the world, Jesus, to those still in darkness, and they will be active soul winners. Lord, I pray that they will crave for the spiritual milk, and which is God's word, and grow in their salvation. Lord, I pray that they, we will spend unhurried time studying your word. Lord, we, I pray that we'll have a biblical relationship with the government, and we thank you for the acronym G-O-V-T. The last one, take your political leaders by name to the Lord. So we pray for our Prime Minister, we pray for our Chief Minister, we pray for our Member of Parliament, we pray for every elected representative. Lord, I pray that you will bless them, prosper them, speak to them, cover them, save them from the assassin's bullet. Give them wisdom to rule. We thank you, Lord, for the example of Jesus. Yes, Lord, that because of Jesus, we are saved and what he did for us on the cross but he's also an example for us it's a, not easy he did not retaliate he did not make threats forgive me for the time when i made threats making threats is beyond my scope it's making threats is beyond my scope thank you for helping me realize this through the study of your word a close study of your word the only person who can who could have made threats was jesus but he did not use that when, at that time when he hung on the cross, he did not make threats. He submitted himself to his father, the God who judges ultimately. Lord, I pray for us, Lord, let us not get disappointed with what, with what a shepherd did. All those sex scandals and all that, let us not get, Lord, bogged down and disappointed and lose our fervor, but because you, the, the shepherd, is still the Sinless example, help us to keep moving forward. 
Thank you for speaking to us in chosen chapter two, covering contemporary issue, the study of first Peter chapter two, with special reference to civil disobedience. Thank you for being with us in this study. Continue to speak to us. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you for joining us. And uh,